All righty. So again, we're so happy to have you here. I am Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and we'll be making a few announcements. If my computer will move to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Well, there's our welcome. And I will be asking about uh, having some volunteers for some events coming up. Um, we'll talk about our spring bird walk series, our exciting news about in-person meetings. Uh, of course, we always like people to become members and signing up for newsletters. Right. I was just, you know. So we've, uh, spring, of course, is always a good time to have events. And yes, we've been asked, we, meaning Western Cuyahoga Audubon, has been asked to participate in a couple of Earth Day events. Uh, one is uh, Earth Day with Sustainable Berea and that's Berea, Ohio. Uh, it is going to be held at the Coe Lake Park in Berea, which is near the library. It is Saturday, April 22nd, and it's only from 10 in the morning to one in the afternoon or until the event ends, which probably is going to be one o'clock. Um, we are going to be having a bird walk starting at 8.30, but our table will be uh, need to be staffed from 10 to one. So it would be really, really wonderful if we could get two more volunteers for that day. Uh, again, it's only a couple of hours, a little bit of setup time, a little bit of tear down time, but we hope that we can get at least two more volunteers for that event. Similarly, we are having, we are going to be at the Parma Heights Earth Day event, but this time it's on Saturday, April 29th, so a week from the uh, Berea event. Uh, that's the one in Parma Heights is from one to four in the afternoon. Again, a little bit of setup, a little bit of tear down time. And uh, again, if you are, are interested in helping, you can see to, where to contact me, info at wcaudubon.org. And I will be sending information about what the volunteer responsibilities are uh, at as we get closer to the time. So I hope that some folks will, will join us and volunteer for one event or the other. Again, the Berea one, I could use a couple of volunteers for Parma Heights. One additional volunteer would be lovely. All righty. So I did want to make an announcement, and this is like hot off the presses. We are going to be meeting, we meaning Western Cuyahoga, is going to be meeting in person. And this is since COVID when we hadn't been meeting. And then we could not get a, a good day to meet at the Rocky River Nature Center. So we will be meeting in person starting in September for our series of meetings and programs. We will meet at the Fairview Park Library, which is a lovely library. And our meetings will begin just a scooch earlier. We will be meeting at seven o'clock in the evenings. Uh, so we are really looking forward to it. We're excited to return to in-person meetings. And we hope, and we're, you know, we're going to be announcing this throughout uh, with our newsletters and at each uh, event we have. So we hope that uh, it, people will join us in person at the Fairview Park Library for our 2023-2024 seasons, again, starting in September. We do like to have folks be kept informed, and we have an e-newsletter that comes out oh, once a week. Um, you can sign up for the e-newsletter either on our website, through our website, uh, or if you can jot this down really quickly, but uh, if you get, get to our website, which is www.wcaudubon.org, you will see a place where you can sign up for the e-newsletter. It comes, uh, again, once a week through MailChimp, reminders about events, programs, updates, things like that. So, and if you think, whoa, we're getting too much information here, 
uh, you can unsubscribe at any time. So we hope that you can sign up for the e-newsletter. All righty, Michelle, oops. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to cover our upcoming bird walks, a biggest day with David Lindo event, and invite you to connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. And please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. The next one is this Saturday, April 8th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in April, we had several highlights, including 15 golden crown kinglets, five brown creepers, two winter runs, and our first of year hermit thrush. So hope to see you this Saturday to see what we get this year. All right, next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on March 11th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, uh, the March 2023 second Saturday of the month bird walk had 13 observers. It was cloudy and windy with the temperature at 33 degrees the entire walk. We had a good woodpecker hike with 10 downies, four harries, and two pileated woodpeckers. Two barred owls were perched in a pine tree and were visible for all to see. The highlights were an estimated 50 robins on the grassy areas by Frostville Museum and a pair of brown creepers that are continually observed at the feeding station at the Nature Center. Next slide, please. And so please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for our Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. The next one is on April 22nd at 9 a.m. A meeting at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, um, just west of West 13th Street and east of the I-90 Interbelt Bridge. Uh, Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk and they will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. Uh, last month, the group was treated to good looks at Northern Mockingbird and some killdeer. We had high counts of an estimated 150 common grackle. The most exciting sight of the bird walk was watching a peregrine falcon soar above a flock of starlings and then go into a dive to try and nab one, unsuccessfully, however. Next slide, please. All right, so Frory Meadows is a 298 acre park that offers trails through prairie, wet sedge meadow, and woodland habitats. I birded this location last April with my uncle and experienced birder, Bob Opper, and was amazed at the variety of species we found. Last year, we had 36 species, including the Savannah Sparrow, Eastern Meadowlark, Eastern Bluebird, Tree Swallow, Brown Thrasher, Killdeer, Virginia Rail, Wilson Snipe, and Sora. Please join us on April 22nd at 8 a.m. for this joint bird walk with Western Cuyahoga Audubon and Kirtland Bird Club. So yes, we have two walks going on the same day. So plenty for you to do. All right, next slide, please. All right, David Lindo is coming back. So please mark your calendar for May 6. The day will consist of a morning joint bird walk with Western Reserve Land Conservancy at Brighton Park, which is full. Uh, we will have an opportunity to do lunch with David at Market Garden Brewery that is limited registration only, an afternoon bird walk at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve that is open to all, and then a group dinner with David at Sibling Revelry Brewing that is limited registration only. And both members and guests uh, can register for these lunches and, and dinners. So please, um, if you're interested, uh, go ahead and register. Um, I will put a link to the registrations in the chat when I am done with my announcements. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, lastly, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. And I believe that's it for me. Thank you so everyone. much. Yeah, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and I, a lot of the photos that you're seeing that Michelle has taken, uh, some of them are from the Scranton Roads, uh, Scranton Road, uh, Tremont uh, Flats area. And uh, then, of course, Michelle loves. The, I, I love the uh, Sandhill Crane photo early on too. That was lovely. That was not at Scranton Flats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, that was in Florida. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wonderful. Ah, Drina Nemes, who is our 
uh, book discussion coordinator is here this evening and will chat with us a little bit about the book discussion series. Drina. I'll say it again. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I really enjoyed the common Greco photo, Michelle. Thanks a lot for that. Beautiful. Um, well, we're in our third season of our book discussion group, and our themes this year have been varied. Climate change, adaptation, especially to climate change. And then we took a little bit of uh, time to look at a kind of a not so popular bird these days, the pigeon, but it, we had a lot of fun with that. And um, our next topic is going to be uh, migration. Next slide, please. So we're gonna be talking about this marvelous book, A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds by Scott Weidensall. This book is just filled with wonderful stories not only of migration, but the history of migration, birds, all kinds of birds, people who do the birding and do the migration studies. It's about culture, it's about countries, it's about islands in the South Pacific and the Atlantic that I've never heard of. It's just marvelously interesting. You can find it at uh, the Cuyahoga uh, Public Library System as well as Cleveland and other community libraries. Next slide, please. I'd also like to remind people about David Lindo's wonderful website. He has a series of live webinars. It's called In Conservation With, and he has interviews with a lot of birders and um, people who do things in natural history, um, nature things. There's just looks like just one session in April. Usually there are several, but I think David must be out and about birding. And we know that he's going to be in May. And then he also has um, a, the all of his previous uh, Zoom meetings, webinars are available in his archive, including one that's listed here, which includes his interview with Scott Weidensall from April of 19, 2021, when Scott's book came, just came out. Um, next slide, please. The Environment of the Americas has such a good book club too. They meet uh, usually the fourth Thursday of the month. And it's such an interesting series. They feature uh, authors too. So you can join in and ask questions. They have a wide selection of topics with their books too. Um, I have here a, a photo of um, the last session, last Thursday, March 30th. It was very good. And um, usually they post their previous webinars in a short amount of time. It's still not posted yet on their website, but if you're interested in uh, more about migration, this is another good opportunity. So hope to see you then. Uh, two weeks from tonight, April 18th, we'll meet at seven o'clock to talk about uh, Scott Weidensall's book, A World on the Wing. Thanks. Well, Drina, this is Nancy Howell. Um, you actually got a chance to see Scott Weidensall uh, not too long ago. Uh, I did. Black, Black River Audubon had him as a very special speaker. And so how did you feel about that? It was, it was just great. He talked nonstop for about at least an, an hour, I would say. And he relayed a lot that's in his book, not everything, but um, he's a very engaging speaker. He has a good sense of humor. And he is, he's like a, um, to me, kind of like a rock star for birding and migration. So um, there were a couple other people from um, our chapter. I was glad to see. Wonderful. So you're a, you're a white and salt groupie, huh? You follow yep. him all over. <laughs> Actually, I asked him for his autograph. <laughs> I've got his autograph. All right. <laughs> and I'll cherish it forever. <laughs> Thanks so much, Drina. We're looking forward to the uh, next season of the book series, which uh, will begin. Uh, what would be the first month uh, for the next season? Uh, probably October. October, okay. Yes. 
Very good. So stay tuned. We will have it listed. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if Marianne Romito uh, has joined us this evening. Marianne, are you here? I guess not, but Marianne is the Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. And uh, Climate Watch is a, a, through National Audubon, it is a collaboration in citizen science. Um, it really is going to be adding data to what has been predicted through modeling of birds disappearing or moving their range with the with change in climate and of course change in habitat. So the summer or actually late spring, early summer climate watch, as you can see, runs from May 15th through June 15th. Um, we actually have selected a one day that we would like to have all participants go out, which is Saturday, June 3rd. And I say, boom, one and done. Uh, so if you've already participated this past winter for, for the um, Climate Watch, summer, again, pick a day, pick that, that, that or select that day. And uh, you know if you're doing more than one uh, square or area, of course, you're gonna to have to do another day as well. And if you can't make it on that Saturday, June 3rd, uh, you can do it uh, again, anytime between that May 15 and June 15 date. Um, if you'd like to see more about the Climate Watch, there is a link to the video that Marianne uh, had, had uh, done. And uh, also you can contact Marianne Romito through Western Cuyahoga Audubon and you can see Mary Ann Romito and with an A-N-N-E uh, uh, at wcaudubon.org or you can phone her as well too. So if you have some questions, if you'd like to select, get a square uh, going, um, then please, we'd love to have additional people because Marianne's area covers everywhere from Lorain County, Medina County, all the way to Columbiana County. So, I mean, we're, we're, there's a lot of area that we'd like to cover. Uh, Amanda Sabrosky is our coffee coordinator, and I know she was not able to be here this evening, but Western Cuyahoga Audubon does sell the Birds and Beans brand coffee. It is the only Smithsonian certified bird friendly coffee, shade grown, organic, fair trade. I mean, it, it is all. Uh, why is it important? Well, remember the birds that are just beginning to migrate northward here spent their uh, winters or non-breeding season down in Central and South America where the coffee plantations are. Um, these coffee uh, farms uh, are left intact where the coffee plants are grown uh, in the shade of the native trees that are there. So it, it really does leave the habitat for um, most of our the migratory birds. And the farmers make a living wage. So really there's a lot that is happening. Uh, you may order the coffee and there's a lot of varieties. You can get different grinds. You can get uh, dark roast, lighter roast. You can get decaf. So there's lots of different kinds. So you can order it from our homepage. And the next order is going in very, very shortly. As you can see, April 10th is when the order is going in. Um, actually, the last order is going to come in. It'll go in on April 11th. It takes about a week turnaround, sometimes less, for them to roast and grind the coffees, send it up here. And then what's even nicer is that we deliver. Uh, so Amanda will contact you as to where to pick up the coffee or if you'd like it delivered to your home. So order now. You can see the next order will not go in until July because we've been ordering quarterly. And uh, you want to make sure you, you get that caffeine, uh, enough caffeine between now and July. I do want to mention a couple of other things that are coming up with our chapter. 
Our May speaker is are going to be Tim Krynak with the Cleveland Metro Parks and Dr. Nathan Beyer, also with the Cleveland Metro Parks. They have been crunching data uh, with a, a, from some of the bird surveys that have been done, of which Western Cuyahoga has played a very important role. And you can see bird communities as bellwethers for habitat quality and disturbance. So it'll be very interesting to see what they have take uh, what they've uh, found with the data that they've come up with through the Cleveland Metro Parks and uh, the bird surveys that have been done. So I can't wait. So that's Tuesday, May second. Uh, again, this uh, it will be a Zoom meeting and starting at seven thirty, like we have this evening. June, we usually, and we will return to our picnic, our plant exchange and bird walk. And it's presented by you, our members and guests. It is on Tuesday, June 6th. We will meet at the Lagoon picnic area in the Rocky River Reservation. The picnic will begin at six o'clock. That's bring your own food, whether it's fast food or something that you'd like to grill. Uh, we will have a, a grill available um, and heated up. Um, plants, bring uh, house plants, bring bulbs, bring native plants from your yard, bring small trees and shrubs. Uh, maybe you have extra seeds left over from your gardening. Bring things so that people can pick and choose and you do not have to bring plants if you don't have any. But if you're there and you see something that you like, please give, give our plants a home. So you can select the plants while we're having dinner. And then the bird walk will start at around seven o'clock and we'll walk around the lagoon area. And we generally have a really nice bird checklist once we finish. So we hope to see you there uh, in June, on Tuesday, June 6th. But this evening, ooh, it's very magical. Uh, Kathy Mock, will be presenting on the magic of Merlins. It's a wonderful story. Now, I wanna introduce Kathy a little bit. Um, she became a birder after realizing that birds were easier to find than whales, especially in Ohio. Um, she having garnered a life list of 17 species of cetaceans, but 559 species of birds, that's amazing. She's a longtime birder, a member of Ohio Ornithological Society and Black Swamp Bird Observatory, a Summit Metro Parks volunteer, formerly a staff member at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And she's a, uh, been a bird guide for Black Swamps, Jet Express, and the biggest week in American birding outings. Kathy's photos have been published in the Ohio Cardinal, as well as in the Root of It, the newsletter of the Summit County Master Gardeners. Many of her photos can be found on Instagram, and you can see her Instagram account. And she maintains the uh, Greater Akron Audubon Society's Instagram page. Her weaknesses include, but not limited to, buying too many bird books and watercolor supplies. Hmm, I can relate to that. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Kathy Mock. So I'm going to stop sharing. And Kathy, how are you this evening? Don't forget to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. Are you ready for me to start sharing? Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay. Oh, I did want to announce that we will take questions either in the chat or at the end of the presentation. So we hope that you can stay with the entire thing. Are you? It's coming. Able to see. Okay, great. It's coming. It's been 
the um, presentation has been snoozing, so it might take a minute for it to wake up here. Wake up presentation. I know how that is. And instead of starting at the beginning, it randomly decided to start where it wanted to start. We love technology. Yep. And you try to prepare and you think you're prepared and then it throws a wrench in. How does that look? Yay, it looks lovely. Very good, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining this evening and thank you to Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society for this opportunity to share what I've learned about these fascinating falcons, also known as my Merlins. When a line from the movie, The Princess Bride popped into my head, I couldn't resist modifying it slightly to welcome you. Moons are what brings us together today. I don't regularly do presentations. So it's stuck again. <laughs> there we go. So, um, I hope I don't seem too nervous. And it's now it's going ahead of me. Okay, settle down here. Presentation. Okay. Um, I have a disclaimer. I know that there are people in attendance who are much better photographers than I. And I know my photos are not all National Geographic quality and some are documentary documentary only, but I put this together to the best of my ability using as many as my own photos as I could. But if a photo doesn't meet your standards, talk to the hand. <laughs> I'm not a trained observer, but I monitor these birds because I've fallen in love with them. I submit information to iNaturalist and of course eBird and I wrote an article about these Merlins that was published in the spring 2022 issue of the Ohio Cardinal. Thank you, Craig. A publication of the Ohio Ornithological Society and is the quarterly journal of bird observations in the state. My great hope is that my observations will add to the scientific knowledge of these falcons in this area. And if I mention a point that I've read that isn't accurate, if I made an assumption that isn't accurate, I apologize in advance and I would welcome corrections as long as they're polite. <clears throat> it is not wanting to advance and it'll probably end up going too far. Um, the Latin name is Falco columbarius. Falcon is from a Latin word for sickle, which refers to the claws or talons, which you can see um, noted by the arrow at the bottom. The common name Merlin doesn't have anything to do with the wizard of the same name, but they still seem to me to appear and disappear like magic. Um, compared to a red-tailed hawk or something, which is more like, yo, we're going to the zoo, uh-huh, uh-huh. The collo colloquial name pigeon hawk is because of it looking like a pigeon in flight, although they can hunt pigeons, versus the peregrine falcon's name of duck hawk, which is because of them hunting ducks and they hunt pigeons too. Our North American birds are separate from Eurasian species and split from other living falcons around 5 million years ago but Merlin lineage as a whole may have originated in North America.
there are three North American subspecies, the black Merlin, which is primarily in the Northwest of the United States. It's a dark Pacific coast bird um, from about Southern Alaska to Northern Washington state and their residents there. There's the prairie Merlin, which is a pale Merlin of the central United States and the Great Plains from Alberta to Wyoming. And they're mostly residents there, but there is some winter dispersal. But the prairie Merlin is not a prairie falcon. They are different species. Our Merlin is, a, is known as a taiga Merlin also known as a boreal or tundra merlin. And their plumage is intermediate between dark and pale. Their wingspan is about 21 to 23 inches. And their subspecies is Falco columbarius columbarius. They're in Canada and the northernmost United States east of the Rockies, except for the Great Plains. They're migratory. They winter in Southern North America, Central America, the Caribbean and Northern South America. They, quote, rarely winter in the Northern USA, according to the literature. And the Merlin is the mid-sized model of the three falcons that we're likely to see in Ohio. This is the smallest one, the American Kestrel, and you can see the, the uh, facial pattern that's pretty distinct there and some spotting on the breast. This is a Kestrel above compared to a Merlin below. And the Hawks in Flight book states that the Merlin is to an American kestrel what a Harley Davidson is to a bicycle. Compared to a peregrine falcon, and if I could add to the analogies after seeing Merlin so often and peregrines infrequently, when a peregrine flew at eye level on the Ottawa driving tour in October, to me it looked like a box truck, only faster. The identification characteristics or field marks for Merlin are the pointed wings, the streaked breast, the checkerboard underwing pattern, and the banded tail. As with other raptors, the male is smaller than the female, and they think that this helps them hunt to different prey species and decreases the necessary territory size to feed the pair. So you see the smaller male on the left and the larger female on the right. And the adult male uh, has a blue coloring to its back and the adult female is more brown. And then we also have the Cooper's hawk, which at a quick glance, if one flies through the cemetery, it, it could be easily confused. They're fast, very fast as well. Um, but again, definitely different species. So as far as size, you can see here size of a Merlin at the top compared to a Northern Flicker at the bottom. So very, very similar. And the Flicker's on the left and the Merlin's on the right. Compared to the American Crow with the Merlin being in the, above these two crows, there's a significant size difference. This perspective is a little bit strange in this photo, but nonetheless, you can see the difference in, in size between the two. And then the blue jay, again, is pretty similar in size to the Merlin. The habitat that Merlins like can vary, but they generally prefer a mix of low and medium height vegetation with some trees avoiding both dense forests and treeless regions, except during migration when they can be found in virtually any habitat. Mm -hmm. 
going to back up because it had a lag there and then it I apologize. Let me catch up here. If it will let me. You didn't think television rerun re, rerun season would start so soon. So again, you can see the comparison in the Blue Jay and the Merlin sizes. The Blue Jay in this photo is above the Merlin. <clears throat> there, um, this map shows where they're supposed to be. Um, so in summer, they're in the peach colored area, mostly in Canada. A few might be in North or Central Pennsylvania and New York. Um, and some have become so well adapted to urban settings that they do not migrate. Migration to their breeding range may start in late February and most have arrived there by late May. And they're typically on record as southbound migrants as late as September or October. They hunt laterally instead of diving like a peregrine, often less than four feet over the ground, but they'll capture most of their prey in the air. So where a peregrine climbs to a height and then dives steeply and quickly, the Merlin will dive off of something and then drop real low and then fly straight across to catch up with whatever it's hunting, which is typically birds. They do like high vantage points, which is why you often see them in a treetop in a cemetery or here in the cemetery in this photo at the top of a power stanchion. And this is the lesser known antenna Merlin, which of course doesn't exist, but it's just showing again that they do like the high vantage points and they'll take advantage of what they can find. Um, one was even observed standing on a grazing sheep to have a view off the ground. Breeding pairs may hunt cooperatively with one bird flushing prey towards its mate, and they've been observed trying to catch cars and trains. One in 20 hunting attempts is successful even when conditions are poor, but when conditions are good, every other attempt is successful. They sometimes cache food to eat later. Pete Dunn had said he's never seen one fail to catch its target, even if it took more than one attempt. When overwintering in the Cayman Islands, birds called banana quits are reported to have died from apparent heart attacks or strokes without being caught, simply from being chased by and unable to escape a merlin. On the other hand, adult merlins may be taken by peregrine falcons and great horned owls, but they usually, um, raptors usually avoid hunting merlins due to their aggressive behavior and their agility. And one of their characteristics is their willingness to chase larger raptors from their territory. Um, merlins have a tomial tooth on the bill and when they catch their prey, they will, um, this, tooth helps them to break the neck of the bird that they've caught. They will eat um, bats, dragonflies, grasshoppers, rabbits, voles, lizards, snakes, birds ranging in size from warblers to quail and including shorebirds and birds even as large as rock pigeons. They may, a bird may eat up to 900 birds a year and they require about a half to one and a half ounces of food per day, the heavier being 
about the equivalent of at least one house sparrow. Um, last summer, I saw one finish a bird and then catch a second one and prey is plucked and decapitated before being eaten or being brought to the nest. Um, it seems from what I can see of their prey that it's for the most part, they seem to focus on house sparrows. And I don't have any complaints about that. And um, under one of the stanchions, I did see uh, this wing of probably a big brown bat that was probably caught by a merlin. And under a tree, um, this former chimney swift, and I can't say for sure that it was caught by a merlin, but I'm not sure what else would have been fast enough to catch a chimney swift. This one looks like he's got a little bit of uh, remains on his belly, which also reminds me of another movie line. Um, Would the monsieur like a waffle thin the mint? When the Monty Python movie where the glutton goes into the restaurant and wants to eat and ends up exploding because he, they keep serving him all the food that he wants. They're, they expel pellets like other raptors. Um, their pellets are made of indigestible material like bones. And here you can see the size compared to a hawk or an owl. I'm not sure what the pellet is at the bottom. Um, but even passerines produce pellets. Um, at Nemesilla Reservoir, I saw this female bluebird cough up a pellet that was black and was probably composed of insect exoskeletons. Their vision is about eight times better than humans and they say that they can see prey two miles away. And I'm gonna give it a minute here to go to the next slide if you don't mind, rather than having to go start at the beginning again. While Kathy's getting her slide presentation back up, uh, we know how technology is. Um, it's interesting, you know, you can put messages, questions in the chat. Don't forget to do that. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting when Kathy mentioned that Merlins aren't supposed to be here in the winter time, and yet we kind of expect them on our Christmas bird count. Um, so, they don't read the books, I guess. I know I have internet problems at times too, especially when it's a big presentation, you got lots of slides. And I'm loving the photos that Kathy is showing. Looking at the size of the Merlin compared with jays, crows, kestrels. I hope Kathy will be able to join us. Looks like she's off the group here. But there is a question that did come in on the chat. Um, it, what is the special tooth call that the Merlin uses for killing its prey? And are there other birds that have this? Um, Kathy pointed out it's called a tomial tooth. It's really just part of the beak. It's like a little extension on the beak. And as far as I know, only falcons have a that tomial tooth. Again, as Kathy mentioned, it is for biting the neck of particularly birds or severing the, the neck and the spine. So they don't jump around a whole lot. Makes it a quick death. 
So tomial tooth, and again, I'll put in tooth in air quotes because it's really not a tooth because birds don't have teeth. I see there's another question in the chat. And yes, we have had great weather today. Um, lots of birds. And it said, uh, the, those person that wrote it thought they might have seen a warbler pair this morning. Um, any other spring migrants arriving? Yes, there are spring migrants arriving. Probably the only warblers that would be in the area now would be yellow rumped warblers. They're some of the earliest coming through. Uh, kinglets, golden crown kinglets are coming through. And uh, certainly the swallows, we have uh, tree swallows. Um, northern rough wing swallows may be arriving as well. Oh, good. Somebody else mentioned the yellow rump warbler. Um, fox sparrows. Sparrows should be arriving shortly. Fox sparrows, chipping sparrows, swamp sparrows, field sparrows. Those are some that, that I know I've run into the past few days. So, yep. Things are starting to move. Oh, good, Kathy's with us now. And I will be quiet. I got disconnected from the call. I hope I'm back. Um, Jared Potter Kirtland reported a nesting pair in Cuyahoga County before 1858, um, which I missed when I wrote my Ohio Cardinal article. Um, the lack of details for other reports in the 20s and 30s led Peter John to believe that the identifications were questionable. So here's a map of Ohio. Um, most of you. Um, are familiar with this. Um, are you sharing your screen, Kathy? No, I... I... I again have made you a host. Okay. How's that? Am I sharing? Yes, you're sharing. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, again, most of you know what the map looks like, but our guest from Toronto, <laughs> this might be helpful. Um, so here we are uh, down around here. Um, when that book was published, there had been no summary Merlins reported since 1934. Um, I've been able to add reports to eBird with photos to help fill in gaps in the bar chart for Summit County to the point that now there are um, only four weeks missing through the year, the last two weeks of May, the last week of June, and the first week of July. So if you're still awake, great. If not, it's okay, even this guy's sleeping. Um, if you are still awake, um, I'd like to tell you now about the Summit County Merlins and how they've contradicted many of the things that they were not supposed to do. I don't in any way mean to imply that the location I'm focusing on is the only place in Summit County where they've been seen. Um, they've been seen in Bath Nature Preserve, Sand Run Metro Park, Rose Hill Burial Park, 
on and on. Um, but this is Summit County within Ohio. Here is Akron. Here's Cleveland up here. Um, this bird was at Nemesilla Reservoir. Um, and then here, zooming in more in Summit County um, with Green Lawn Cemetery in the lower mid left. Um, so I'm reporting on my own experiences based on six years of observing Merlins at this cemetery, three miles from my house. Um, most people visiting the cemetery probably think it's pretty dead there, or is it? A Merlin found me first and I've been wrapped around their sickle shaped talons ever since. On February 18th of 2017, one buzzed my bird feeders in Barberton during the great backyard bird count. And I photographed it perched on the next block. And it seemed like this cemetery, Green Lawn Memorial Park, three miles from my house by car or two miles in a straight line would be a logical location for it to hang out. So I went there and lo and behold, now I don't know how that picture got in there because that is not my picture. But I did find a Merlin there on February 21st of 2017. So I've gone from one bird then to eight birds um, during the winter of 2021-2022. These are multiple photos of some of the same individuals. Um, and a winter day with sun in Ohio is so rare that I have to take as many photos as I can. But through consecutive winters, the number of Merlins has grown to eight, a number I observed on three different dates during the winter of 2021-22, and also on December 10th of last year. And I meticulously double checked to ensure that I'm not counting individuals more than once. I found one location in the cemetery where amid leafless winter trees, I can see six preferred perches at one time. And I sometimes end up logging over four miles of driving around the 68 and a half acre cemetery during a single eBird checklist, looking to make sure of the location of the birds. One term, for a group of Merlins is an illusion. And I wonder if people think I make up these numbers, but I know the trees and I know how they're shaped. And when the top of an evergreen doesn't look like it normally does. And so even if I see another birder there, I can often point out a bird to them that they missed. A few Merlins have overwintered at Calvary Cemetery in Cleveland in the past with a high count of four in February, 2021. Um, but to have that many or more than that in one location is highly unusual. In this picture, there are three Merlins. This increase in wintering birds from one to eight in Summit County suggests that there's been a successful breeding locally. And one of the questions I have is if they were not hatched here, how did they all find each other and know to gather at Green Lawn? Also of note is that communal roosting is rare in the United States and communal as a term used with birds is normally several birds in one tree or a roosting box or a small area. So I don't know if eight birds within 63 acres is loosely considered communal or not. In 2021, my latest spring sighting was April 7th, and my next sighting was July 15th. The July sighting was unusual for the date and location and was more circumstantial evidence that at least one bird never left in the spring. I was naive in assuming that they had all left the year before last, so I failed to look seriously for them during those three months. But on April 8th of 2022, I observed territorial defense, and by April 13th, they were hunting more in the area. Based on my observations during the winter, they seem to use the cemetery more for overnight roosting, but they do more hunting elsewhere. 
they can be there during the day, but they're more reliably seen in late afternoon or the evening. When they arrive in the evening, they often perch on a stanchion to extensively preen and clean up. After much monitoring of their behaviors on April 15th, I finally found the nest that they chose and I saw a bird at the nest on several dates. I observed copulation on six dates from April 12th through the 25th and I photo documented copulation as well as the female at the nest and in the nest. And they were very active, defending the territory, vocalizing and so on. And I recorded their vocalizations. This is the first documented Merlin nesting attempt in Summit County. And I had thought it was probably the first in Ohio north of Knox County with the exception of Lake County. And there was no mention at all in the first Atlas of a Breeding Birds Atlas of Ohio um, in 1982 through 1987 that was published in 1991. I saw a reference to an old nest in Seneca County, which I couldn't relocate. And even with Kirtland's old report from Cuyahoga County, Peter John asserted that there were, quote, no indisputable breeding records from Ohio, end quote, as of 1986. Even the second Atlas of Breeding Birds in Ohio published in 2016 showed only two confirmed nests in Knox and Lake County with four others considered possible. And it was only after that book was published that Merlins were documented nesting in a different Green Lawn, Green Lawn Cemetery in Columbus in Franklin County in 2019. Strangely enough, on October 17th and 20th, of 2021, I photographed a clearly bonded pair of Merlins in an old crow nest, checking it out. And Doug Vogus suggested that because the day length mimicked spring, perhaps that triggered the interest in the nest. I'm aware that of that scenario with frogs vocalizing in the fall, but I hadn't thought about birds exhibiting breeding behavior for that reason. They were also demonstrating agitation and what seemed like territorial defense against blue jays and American crows. Doug had asked me a couple of years ago if I'd consider that they had nested here. And in fact, I hadn't because they weren't supposed to. So back to last year in April, after they should have left the area, I began to observe more hunting and territorial defense. For those of you who have been able to keep your eyes open so far, you may wanna close them now anyway as we enter the adult portion of the program. After frequent visits and a huge amount of stalking, I was over the moon when on April 15th, I observed copulation. Immediately after, they revealed the location of the nest that they chose, and it was in a very large, dense conifer in Barberton, just outside the boundaries of the cemetery. And it was in the backyard of a very nice lady. And after I assured her that the Merlins would not harm her small dog, she was very excited to know that they chose her tree. When I'd asked Amy Phillips to meet me to see if she could get some better telephoto pictures with her camera than I could get with mine, we started in front of Pat's house. And even with my scope aimed at the nest, Amy wasn't sure she was seeing it. And although I could see the nest from the street in front of her house, ironically, the best view and angle seemed to be from the cemetery with a spotting scope. But due to the distance, my photos are documentary and not of the highest quality. It's probably unlikely that they would choose this nest again. But I do wonder why were these dates so early? And I know that courtship behaviors begin before nesting, but if they typically nest in May, did they proceed to copulation in April because they were already in their breeding territory? So this just shows an increase 
in the hunting that they were doing. There are two birds in this photo, one at the very top and one in the lower right. They continued the behaviors and as of April 27th, everything was a go. Until they were gone. And after that, there was complete silence and no activity. And I wondered if she were just down in the nest out of sight, but she was not there. A breeding pair will often allow a yearling male to remain in the territory. And there were three Merlins present through that date with the third interacting a little bit with them, but usually coming in late in the day to perch apart from them. I wondered about three scenarios for the abandonment or failure. Um, one being the cold overnight temperatures during that week of presumed egg laying pre-incubation made the eggs non-viable, but my uneducated guess would be that at least the last egg would survive. Um, maybe bird flu, which I doubted because I hadn't seen much news about it in our area nor seen any evidence of it myself and other species, or being shot at by people in the neighborhood where the Merlins were very obvious during the second half of April. The homeowner said she wasn't aware of anyone harassing them. My monitoring was not a threat or nuisance to the Merlins in any way other than just spying on their sex life. Other than to the homeowner and to Amy, I had only spoken of the location of the nest in very general terms. And I was in touch with a Merlin researcher in Manitoba who stated that she had a pair suddenly move to a different nest even after copulation that was about a half a mile from their original choice due to harassment by crows. And this probably does make the most sense since it's presumably the two breeding birds that went AWOL and I saw continued crow activity near that tree. She advised me to do morning drives around the area and I spent an early morning hour over a week's time driving all the streets in the vicinity with my windows down looking and listening. And I also checked Holy Cross Cemetery, which is another large cemetery a few miles away in case they went further away but I had no luck relocating them. In the meantime, the lone bird continued to come into roost in the evenings, even as late as 9.15 PM. And with sunset around 8.45, there was still enough light to see its silhouette. But on June 16th, it came in earlier than usual and the photos I was finally able to get in good light confirmed that it was in fact a yearling male or SY hatch 2021 per Tom Bartlett with its scapular showing hints of bluish color. So that was pretty exciting for me, but the question remains as to whether it was hatched here the previous year. Ironically, the deadline for submitting my article to the Ohio Cardinal was June 21st. And I submitted it on June 20th. And as it turned out, that was also the last date I saw that bird until August 10th. In my mind, I was sure that my frequent monitoring, this is not my photo, during the summer would present me with a day when I would see a nice little Merlin family made up of the pair and their fledglings all coming into roost, but that didn't happen. Um, I, ob I did observe two Merlins on August 16th when in 2021, I didn't see two until October 17th. Um, I thought I had three in early September, but couldn't confirm three until about three weeks later in September. Um, I confirmed four on October 2nd and so on. I had seven on November 20th, when during the previous winter of 2021, 22, I didn't get to seven until January. I know there were reports of three Merlins at Valley View last fall, which invites speculation that they nested there. But if the Merlin researcher was surprised by a half mile relocation, I'm skeptical of a six mile relocation. 
as well as the likelihood of nesting attempts by two different pairs here in the same season. But every time I think I know something about these birds, they change things up on me. And by the way, a Merlin can fly 30 miles an hour, so it would take about 12 minutes to fly from Greenlawn to Valley View, but I am convinced that they frequently commute to hunt there during the day at Valley View. I continued my observations to see how many gathered in this past winter's illusion of Merlins. The high number was eight on December 10th. And at the end of the following week, we had the storm that brought the those brutal low temperatures and then thick fog. And um, December ended with just five birds. I never saw eight again, but I did have as many as seven again in January on three dates. Something happened again in February when I had no more than five during the first half of the month and I was lucky to find four during the second half of the month. And typically I was seeing three or four until March um, 15th when five came in again. I had a very pleasant surprise two weeks ago on March 21st when unexpectedly I observed a Merlin twice circle a large evergreen on cemetery property and vocalize while it chased a crow out of the tree. Closer inspection revealed a nest that was drawing the Merlin's interest and that was two weeks earlier than the Merlin's territorial behavior began last year. And it was a good sign that a pair may stay in the area again this spring. But when I went back three days later, a crow, then that's his tail there, her tail, a crow was in the nest with no apparent, apparent intention of leaving. And I, I find it ironic that the Merlins depend on the crows to use their abandoned nests, but then the crows give them such a hard time that there's so much competition there. I'm still hopeful that as we're heading into April that the three Merlins that I've been seeing uh, what is hopefully a breeding pair and a young male again, um, that they'll have the time and the good fortune to sort things out and claim a nest they can keep. So this spring, my ultimate hope is to find a nest that produces fledglings and through the next few months, I hope to fill in the missing four weeks of the bar chart for Summit County. And when there are other things I should be doing, I find myself returning over and over to check on them. And sometimes I think, I wish I knew how to quit you. Matt Valencic gave a program and said his wife asks him why he keeps going back to the same place mm -hmm. over and over for the same birds. And he told her he has to keep trying for better photos and I completely get that. And while looking for Merlins or after the Merlins have left their high perches and settled into the trees for the night, there are still photo ops to be had. And sometimes if you just look up, the Merlins magic can be found. This is actually the moon under the rainbow. And the peacefulness of the cemetery and the quiet observation helps me keep my head on straight. So I'd like to thank again, all of you. Um, I'm so sorry for the technical troubles. Thank you for your patience and thank you for all I've mentioned for their support and input, as well as to Green Lawn Cemetery Association Superintendent Donald Paw and staff. And um, thank you for your time and interest in these birds that I love so much. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. Look at that lovely photo. I just love, I just love the photos that you've produced. This is beautiful. Um, if you, you want to uh, take your slides off and we can see folks and uh, I'm going to check the chat area, see if there's any questions there. We talked a few about a few questions while you were working to restore your 
slides. Um, one question had to do with the tomial tooth, which I answered. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Yeah. Um, now you talked about, I'm gonna ask a question and I put it in the chat. Um, you talked about Valley View. Um, you know, we have an area here in Cuyahoga uh, County, a town called Valley View, but what's Valley View in Summit County? Is that- uh, Sorry, I, I didn't even think about that. It's it's in one of our Metro Perks, Cascade Valley. Okay. Summit County Metro Perks. And another thing we talked about while you were again pulling things back together, um, you know, we expect Merlins in our Christmas bird counts. I mean, if we don't, it's like, ah, where's the Merlins? Uh, Cuyahoga Community College campus, not too far away from, from uh, Berea, Middleburg Heights. It's actually in Parma. Um, we get Merlins there. Uh, I've seen them at the Fair County Fairgrounds in Berea. So that map, not right. They're here in the winter. I know. Time. And you I got know. them. I mean, you have seven, eight of them in the winter time. It's like, come on. Again, if anybody else has a question, please unmute and, and go ahead and ask. We're we're here for you. Some nice comments. Enjoy, enjoyed your passion and, and photos were great. Oh, Menor Marsh has a Merlin, apparently. That's nice. Any questions? Any other questions? Hmm. All righty. Well, again, we thank you so much, Kathy. Yep. Yeah, don't worry about the technology stuff. It <laughs> things happen, and and we understand. I think all of us have had stuff like that happen. Right? But it it was very good. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I hope to see other folks uh, at some of our other presentations for May, and then maybe the picnic in June. Um, Remember to sign up for a to help with volunteering at one of the Earth Day events. And uh, I wish everyone have a good evening. Great. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Kathy.